Well, welcome everybody. Um, we are delighted that you've been able to join us to celebrate Ken Robinson's legacy. He was an extremely important person for me personally, um, but I think for the UK and, and Ireland in particular, our development of um, our understanding about social pedagogy, um, he was a prolific writer, really dedicated and, and blogging right up until the end. It, his death that was announced last month was very, very sad for us all, actually. Um, but he, he was on a mission to change the education paradigm and the way that we see education and the way that we see creativity in, in children's learning in particular. Um, so we've got uh, a little plan uh, today to, um, to celebrate his life. And I'm delighted that Gabriel Eichsteller from Thempra and Tour Johansson from uh, Treehouse Associates um, have collaborated with us at SPA to, um, to just have this session, which we want to make sure that his legacy uh, stays alive and keeps developing within social pedagogy in our countries. So um, we are delighted to, to welcome you to this session. And uh, without further ado, I am going to hand over to Tua. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Don't be delighted yet, Robin. You know, see what, see how it goes. <laughs> I'm joking. No, it's good, it's good to have people here and uh, it's exciting. I'm just really quickly going to frame uh, today and I'm really intending to spend no more than five minutes um, to do so. This is the plan for the session. We've got an hour and a half now to half past 11. Offer you welcome, as we've just had here. Um, we'd like to give it a brief introduction and snapshot of Ken Robertson. I'll do that in a moment. We'd like to show as part today um, a little video and we would like to hear you and that is the main focus of this session. Uh, it is actually to create a reflective sharing activity which means really our ability to facilitate that is probably the greatest um, challenge we have and we hope we'll manage. Afterwards we'd like to share something that consolidates the thoughts you may have had. There's a cool app called Jambox which we're going to use it fits very well with the creativity side of this. And so that's what we're doing today uh, with the intention, of course, of finishing on time. So I'll move on with a little bit of a snapshot here. Uh, many of you may be, um, I don't know, degree level educated in Ken Robinson, unlike me, uh, others might not, so, but we were aware that some might not know as much as others. Um, and so we'll say a little bit more about the man himself. So Ken Robinson, uh, his lifeline sits right there. He was 70 years old when he died very suddenly of cancer. Uh, last month, very sadly. Uh, as Robin pointed out, he was prolific till the end. He got very poorly and, and passed. He left behind two adult children, James and Kate, and his wife, Terry. Um, and and to, to summarize some of his work, some of his work over time, it's, uh, it's really a multitude. It's a very sort of beautiful tapestry of many things. He was a professor, so he managed, you could say, in the sort of formal aspects of the education world to, to achieve many credentials there, credentials there, including honorary degrees and awards. But he was also very much involved in grassroots and project leadership and advisor on different things. And as most people know him as a, as a really penetrative and sharp speaker with a sense of humor as well. He's got fantastic, he had a sense of fantastic sense of humor. Um, in terms of his childhood, uh, Without any further analysis on, on that, he was one of seven children. He grew up in a, in a sort of working class um, area of, um, of Liverpool and uh, he wanted to become a footballer like many kids do. But he got polio as a child and actually had de developed through that and the side of the effects after quite a serious limp, which you will see if you see him moving around. He, so he has lived his life with disability and... Um, and, and, and so I wonder in ways whether that's affected also his inclusive mindset and his understanding of the importance of those things. He had great musical taste for some, I think so. Others might disagree. You know, he, uh, this is just a few of a long list. He offered on Desert, Desert Island Discs, which you should go and check out. It's a great little uh, hour to spend. Um, I think it's BBC Radio 4 that has that on replay, I think. So, uh, I would like to say a little something, and this really is brief, about 
his thinking. And the reason is, I think that his thinking has a way of going right into the heart and experiences of people because he talks a lot about education. He talks a lot about development and how to best stimulate creative, um, well-balanced children into you know adulthood and their own sort of learning. Because he says those kinds of things, everyone will have a very um, personal connection point with much of what he says because we've all gone to school and we've all lived our childhood and we will all have various memories, good or bad, about it. Everything he's about, Ken Robinson, in some respects, is uh, how to enable a, a child, a young person, to fulfill themselves, to find their own channel and their own voice in life. And so therefore, this is here is my personal snapshot, really with the only intention of showing you what today's conversation could look like. It's much more interesting to hear what you have to say. And so if I just were to draw up a couple of key phrases that I think he's come up with that are, that are valuable to me, it is that uh, everything he's about, I feel, is everything we're about. I'll say a little more about that in a bit. It is that um, he talks about courage. He talks about tri trial and error, especially error not being an awful thing. He talks about um, an, a mission here, or a vision of a, an active and compassionate society. Isn't that just what we're all about as well? I feel so. Um, he talks about finding and developing voice, whatever that may be. Uh, he talks about inclusion, everything he talks about really. It has inclusion almost um, inherently in it. He talks about uh, individualism versus collectivism. So the idea that we nurture the individual, but we also nurture their sense of the collectivism and their role within it. Uh, he talks about holistic education, and I could go on. Impact of passion, I could go on with arts. This is creativity. So there are many, many things I could talk about here that has a connection point and his publication list is long. His film clips are, um, you know, ample. Sorry, Tura, I accidentally muted you. I just wanted to admit the latest person to join us. <laughs> Adriana was ahead of me. Can you just unmute yourself, please? Sorry, yeah, I can uh, admit the people and yeah, if you can unmute uh, Thor, please. Am I back now? Yeah. Follow Thank you. Way. So where did I drop out? Sorry, I didn't notice that happening. Where did I, so roughly? You dropped out when you started with that slide. Cool. So I was going to say, just to frame the next, uh, the next while here, with that in mind, and everything that's very personal, in my view of him, of course, his publication list is long, there's loads of material available on the man. What I would say about this is that I feel, if I think of Ken Robinson and what he's all about, that he embodies nearly everything I feel we are working towards as a collective as well, as a movement in this country. I think for me, he has thought and said things that resonate with many, nearly all people, but and that puts him in a sort of, in fine company with many of our key thinkers who have at different times, sometimes through adversity, spoken a message, starting with Rousseau and many others, given a message across that actually resonates with many people and gets its own kind of, you could say, life in people's minds. It may seem further from reality now than it did five years ago when it comes to the education system, for example, but nevertheless, I think he's given us a, a gift for the social pedagogy movement and a potential key thinker, I suppose, for the future, no doubt. Um, and that's really uh, my own justification for being part and of arranging this. So I'd like to hand it over now with a clean sheet and hear what your thoughts are over to Gabriel. Thanks, Tara. That's, that's fascinating as a little snapshot. Um, Robin had a little video that we wanted to show you at this point um, because it kind of epitomizes some of his work in his own words, interviewed by a child. So over to you, Robin. You're still on mute though. Tua, could you stop your share and then I will share mine. I think we're doing incredibly well. <laughs> uh, don't speak too soon. <laughs> okay, so if you're ready, there's just a short um, interview by Mason. You might need to adjust your volume on your respective screens. Today I am meeting with Sir Ken Robinson. He's an educationalist who is a major advocate for creativity in schools and really trying to get that student interaction. Today, I am talking to him at Bob Baker's Marionette Theater. Let's go check out what he has to say. 
Hello, Sir Ken. It's nice to meet you. I'm Mason. Hi, Mason. Nice. Uh, can you tell me who you are and a bit about what you do? No. <laughs> okay. Well, that happens. <laughs> hey, off the bad start, you see, I I can. Um, I always have a hard time telling people what I do, but I'll tell you who I am. I'm Ken Robinson. I am an educator, um, a writer. Um, I've worked in education all my life, and I get increasingly asked on the kind of education I think people need now for the 21st century. A big thing I have is that a lot of schools aren't designed to get the best out of kids, and, um, and we need better schools to do that. Robin, can you just unmute yourself? So I think you just killed the sound. <laughs> it's something that we need to, uh, well, teachers need to bring out inside of their students. Well, because creativity is what makes us human. Life is relatively short. We, we start small, we grow up, we flourish, we get older, we need nutrients to be alive at all, as much as the fish or the, the zebras do. But there's obviously a difference between us and the rest of life on Earth as well. I mean, one of them is that other creatures you know, they're not going to school. Human beings do, and we're the only creatures who do. You know, we write books, we produce music, we create technology, we have uh, languages which are sophisticated, and you know, we design clothes. You know, we live in a world that we have created, and different cultures create the world differently. So to me, it's what makes us human. And if you stifle that in education, then you're suppressing a big part of people's humanity. A curious question. Yeah. You're clearly a pretty funny guy. <laughs> Uh, what is the best joke you've ever told? I don't think I can tell you that particular joke. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it is really funny. <laughs> Call me when you're 18. <laughs> I'll tell you that joke. <laughs> if I can remember it by then, I'll probably pass it off by then. Now, uh, how were you in school as a kid? Were you ever a troublemaker? Did you do great in terms of grades? Just how were you as a kid in school? Uh, how old are you now? I'm 12. Okay. Well, up until 12, I was good. It's just a warning. When you become a teenager, you become a bit harder to please about some things. You know. I'm trying to find the right way to put this. You wouldn't know this, but in, in the early 50s, there was a big epidemic of polio in England, well, actually in America as well. And it was a bad disease. And I, people who got it, you could die, you get paralyzed. And so I got it when I was four. My dad was very smart. My mum mom was too. And although they'd never been to college, they could see the, the importance of it. And they used to say to me, my dad particularly, you know, um, you're not going to make a living doing manual work, you know, like your brothers could or your sister, or doing some heavy job. You're going to have to use your head. And, uh, and he kept pushing me, saying, you know, you've got to do well at school. You've got to focus on your exams. So is, would you say that's sort of how uh, your childhood sort of affected what you do now? And if not, how, did, how would that correlate? You know, it's an interesting thing, this... Mason, I've, um, I wrote a book a few years ago, which is very good. I'm just saying, you should get this book. Um, it's called uh, The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. Uh, I've been asking people around this, I won't put you on the spot, but I've been asking people recently how many human beings they think have lived on the Earth. The best estimate, there's been like 100 billion human beings like us. It's a lot, it's a big number. There are about 7.5 billion on the planet now, so it's a lot of people. But the thing is, every single life has been different, unrepeatable, and unique. And the reason is, in part, that we all have our own talents, and we have imaginations, and we can we create our own life. So the reason I'm saying this is that, yes, obviously, what happens to you at school has a big influence. Of course it does. Um, but it's not a straight line from school to what you do afterwards. I've been asking people, I, I travel a lot, you know, I speak to quite large groups, and I've been asking people when I was working on the Element book, um, how many people knew exactly what they were going to do with their lives when they were 12? Very few. Or rather, I've been saying, oh, how many of you are doing now what you thought you'd be doing when you were 12? And people follow all kinds of paths. You know, they go to college, they might study big dentistry. But they end up being a DJ somewhere. You know, or, you know, or they might, they might think they're going to be a manager or an economist, and they end up running a home for elderly people or teaching in the kindergarten, and, and a dozen other things besides. I mean, ask adults as you go around if they're doing now what they thought they'd be doing at school. So um, what happens at school is very important, but then you create your own life after that.
and it's about the opportunities you take and the ones you don't, the things that interest you, the things that don't. But I always believe you can do anything. People who achieve remarkable things do that because they think they can and they're willing to invest and you know, get confident and invest in it. It's, it's that old saying, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you probably won't. I mean, do you, if, do you have any idea just now what you might do? Not, not really. I have a lot of interests. But like what? Uh, I love entertainment. I love uh, writing. I love uh, athletics. I love politics. I love a lot. That's fantastic. Do you play anything? In terms of... Uh, Instruments. I'm learning how to play guitar, yeah. but I'm a lefty, so it's sort of hard to try to figure out how to use my right hand and still yeah. play at the same time. Yeah, well, you can do that. Paul McCartney, do you know Paul McCartney? Yes, sir. Um, he's left-handed. It's supposed to be Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your advice to kids? Two things, really. One is to explore your own talents and to know that you have them. An awful lot of people think they don't have any talents or abilities because they go through a system which doesn't encourage them to discover them. That's the first thing. And the second is to know that you do create your own life and that you can recreate it. I mean, if you look at my situation in 1955, you know, in hospital with polio in a working class family, uh, it didn't seem very likely that all these years later I'd be in LA talking to you about it, or that we'd meet like this. Uh, and that's because our paths take us in that direction and because you create your life. And I, I just want those get people to realize that you don't have to be a victim. People can achieve extraordinary things from all kinds of beginnings. And where you start is not where you have to end up. You should respect where you come from, but you shouldn't be bound to it if you feel that you have a, a different path to take and you can create that path. Thank you. It was very nice to see you. My pleasure, Mason. Great questions, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You should do this professional at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing being able to meet Sir Ken Robinson. It was also great to see how much of a sense of humor he had and understand his creative ideas for making education more fun. And until next time, I'll see you later. And there we are. What did people think? Show us some reactions in your... <laughs> in in the there's a reactions box there yeah that's a, a i i particularly really like that little video it just shows how humane and lovely what a wonderful wonderful human being all round was our ken as we like to call him in uh, in social pedagogy circles so gabriel i'm going to now hand over to you yeah, thanks. That that was a really lovely kind of little snapshot of what what he felt was important around education. And I think as as we've previously mentioned briefly, it it kind of relates to so much more than than just school. And it it really has a kind of whole life uh, perspective that underpins it. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to put you into breakout rooms and um, give you an opportunity to discuss in your breakout rooms. What does Sir Con Robinson's work mean to you? So what what ideas do you particularly relate to? Uh, what do you find important? Can be stuff that was said in the video, um, can be stuff that you've read or heard elsewhere. Um, so it's just an opportunity to give you a bit of time to just immerse yourself in, in dialogue and find out what what yeah, what his work, his ideas um, really mean to all of us. Um, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms of four to five if um, I'm able to do that. Um, so that would be six breakout rooms. Perfect. So I hope you all had exciting conversations. I can definitely attest that we did. Um, so group six was definitely a good group to be in. Um, but I'm sure all the other groups were fantastic too. So we wanted to kind of try and draw some of these things together. Um, and I'm going to post a link to a Google Jamboard, which you can just click on and then it'll open it in your browser. And um, you'll be able to see um, a virtual um, whiteboard in effect. And um, at the left side, um, there is an opportunity for you to kind of, you know, do little drawings with a pen or add a sticky note um, or add an image or um, add a text box 
um, whatever you fancy. So if you want to share your reflections on Sir Ken's work, not just in, you know, as you have done in the group, um, but actually write that down, you know, whether that's a, a favorite quote of his or what's inspired you or a little story um, about, you know, things that you might have used in your practice. That would be super fantastic now in the next part. And then we've got a little bit to talk about. Um, whilst you're doing that, you can also just tell us um, what your group discussions were about. Um, so if anybody's not into drawing or uh, writing and more into talking, then feel free to just unmute yourself and yeah, we can have a conversation. Also, if we do run out of space on this particular frame, you should be able to change frames and click to the next frame at the top middle of this legacy wall, um, just in that navigation bar there. So if you find that we're running out of out of space on that one, we can just extend and add more frames to it. So anyone want to share their reflections? Or are you all working away on the on the Jamboard? <laughs> well, we we had some really great reflections in our group about sort of the the relevance of his work on just like trying to empower people to feel like actually we all have inherent resources, intrinsic richness, um, things to offer, and actually we need to feel like we can bring those in. I think we, we were saying that we often meet um, practitioners that feel like they're only doing care um, and what they have to offer is nothing that kind of goes beyond them. And that transformation that takes place when they see themselves as active learners, as people with potential, as people who are creative, um, and the way that they can then kind of help others in their care to kind of see themselves as learners and as as kids or older adults um, with creative potential, um, great things happen. So I think that's kind of our mission very much to, to help practitioners kind of recognize um, what they have within them. We had, we had a similar too. You were sort of, in a way, we were trying to sort of close, weren't we? And then we, you were stopped mid-sentence, uh, Sue. But that sentence was a good one. Would you mind repeating it sort of in terms of we were talking about I the think, universality? I think I was going to say that it takes a village to, to raise a child. That's a quote from somebody. I, I don't know who, um, but we use it quite a lot uh, in terms of what um, a, a child needs from the adults around them um, in the wider sense. So, um, yeah, the... the um, for me, uh, Sir Ken, is, is the word that you used was earlier was provocative and uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, certainly at Kibble, we, we try very hard um, to uh, look at the person as a whole. Um, our kids can be quite difficult to work with. Um, they have a lot of trauma, uh, they, have, they have a lot of issues and they can be very angry a lot of the time. So again, to uh, support young people and help them to think that they can learn and that they have the confidence is, is a huge uh, task. But so we have to be very creative in both our approach to care and also to education because these some of the kids can't even sit down for more than 10 minutes. So, um, yeah, we have to think in our feet. And uh, certainly um, the concepts that uh, Sir Ken comes up with supports that and almost allows you to do that. You know what I mean? You, it's almost like you're getting permission to, to be creative, um, whereas in, in your normal kind of system you, you you feel you don't have that permission so and that was kind of reinforced by the fact that some one person was talking mainly from parenting another person with additional mm -hmm. needs at school mm -hmm. you were talking from the care system it seemed very universal what yeah. you described there didn't it as a as a as a focus on the child's inherent creativity yeah. and yeah. uh, we we uh spoke about uh the the covid period <laughs> And um, that many, many children actually strived when they had been out of school, could be learned, could learn from home, 
could learn, could use their own creativity more, um, decide what they want to focus on. And for some children that worked, worked really, really well. Um, and uh, but then we also spoke about uh, the challenges that had for, for, for some parents to to actually to have happen. Um, so I think, yeah, he said it's a relevant right at this moment. Yeah, that's a good point. Claire Cameron did a little blog after having mm -hmm. spoken to um, uh, a few people in Scotland, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly about that. Mm -hmm. um, how, how actually that was a really a brilliant opportunity in a really crazy way to see how we can do things differently. Mm -hmm. um, in our group, I had the, the wonderful Jesse, Martin and Ian and Martin did quite a lot of um, research into Ken for his uh, thesis and you were making some really interesting points, Martin, and that as you got your video on, I would invite you in to, to talk a little bit about what, what we were talking about. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, we were just kind of reflecting in the beginning um, about who knows what about Ken and and then just kind of went on a bit of an inspirational uh, journey together, just sharing of what what, what um, Ken, what impact Ken has had on our lives. And I was sharing a little bit about the time I, I was trying to um, write a literature review and kind of uh, find a way to tell everyone that the education system is could be improved. Let's put it that way. And um, how Ken Robinson really puts it in so nice and inspirational word and so common sense. One size does not fit all. We are all human beings. If the, if the flower doesn't flourish, you don't fix the flower. You adjust the soil, you adjust the environment, you create a nourishing um, space where individual um, creativity can unfold and where people, children can play and be children. And if they aren't sitting still and aren't being quiet and aren't listening, maybe they are dancers and not academics. And to really just give that space of the unfolding of potential for children to be in their element. Um, I'm doing it as we speak. I am letting my creative flow intuition go into my words and somewhat um, <laughs> Um, reply to, to, to that invitation from Robin to simply just um, be amazed and enthused by this gift that Ken Robinson has left to the world. Maybe to finish off a little story, one of the little tribute videos shares how, how there was a little girl and uh, the teachers are um, asking, inviting the parents into the school and say, your, your daughter has ADHD. Um, she is needs um, additional support or whatever. And um, as far as I remember the story writes, they were sitting in the, in the classroom, the, the, the parents and the, the, the daughter and, and um, maybe another educator or whatever it was. And um, they were discussing it. And then one of the people in the room suggested, okay, let, let's go outside for a second, all the teachers and the parents, um, and said to the little girl, we'll be back in a second. And he turned on the radio on the way out and and they went into another room where they could see her, but she couldn't see them. And as soon as they left, he, she started dancing on uh, beautifully, dancing on the tables and dancing around the room. And um, that, that person said to the parents, your daughter is not um, ADHD, your daughter is a dancer. And the story goes on that she went to the, to the Royal Academy of Dancing School and literally conquered the world dancing. Um, and how she felt, there is a book, um, how she felt that suddenly when she was in the dancing school, that she was suddenly amongst people that are like herself, that can't sit still and really unfold her potential. And I think that that story kind of represents a little bit what Ken Robinson gave to the world, that we really need to look at each individual's creativity individually and uniquely and give it 
space and individual attention and creativity. Lo a lovely example of that, Martin, is, is Temple. Oh, your Temple Grandin, the person with lens with um, autism. Her story is fantastic. Yeah, so there's some. Um, yeah, I think it's very important. Oh, that was Temple Grandin herself. That's very interesting. Nice. So that's my gift of creativity. Thank you. Right now. <laughs> Yeah. Any other thoughts? I think that's for me what, what struck me with Ken and my memories always will be fond so linked to, to my own experience of education. Um, don't know, people on my training have heard me say, my English teacher said, Alex, you will never be able to speak English. So something <laughs> happened on, on my journey, as he said, leave school behind, let go of it and then meet people. And unfortunately, she just didn't know about learning styles uh, and she would have me got me a letter friend in England or in Australia to because for people, I make the effort to learn and just not for the boring book and vocabulary. So it's very deep to me and to most people I have met and talked to him. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, um, we, yeah, very, uh, very personal, it's not only professional here. <laughs> I think loads of us might. Uh, I have a, I have a, a, a reflection, more of a question to the, to the group for later on when we start capturing. Uh, and it's Kim Johnson from Derbyshire, who's not on this call, but who's a, a real friend of social pedagogy and also of the arts. And she was a huge Ken Robinson, um, a lover of Ken Robinson for many, many years. And she said something, she referred to something once, which I actually don't think strictly speaking comes from his, say his textbook, but which lends itself well in, and it's the term super encountering. I don't know whether anyone's come across that term as a feature of education and how we work. And that's the bit I wanted to sort of talk about really super encountering. So encountering things links to the a sort of an old, an older version or understanding of the word serendipity. Serendipity is seen sometimes by people as a sort of divine touch or a, a some sort of magical, um, you could say, um, fate just dealing you with some good cards all of a sudden, but actually serendipity in a sort of a more original understanding of the word also has something to do with the mindset that we apply to life. And the reason I mentioned serendipity and super encountering is that the sort of strap line that comes with that is for our practices, wherever they are, our teaching practices, care practices, whatever we do, is to think how are we going to discover the things we are not yet aware of, find the things that we do not expect to find if we're not heading into our practices, whatever they may be, our relationships with uh, an open and accommodating mind for uh, a curveball or a left field ball that leads us in. It may be where a child finds their greatest talents, but in the, in the, in the day of today, I mean, the way we work and the way we are expected to work with square pegs through square holes, how do we actually in our practices, in our ways, accommodate that sort of vision? Because I think that's what Ken Robinson's all about, really. Mm. Isn't he? He's about following the child and also letting the child take a great deal of leadership in, in those things. Uh, so that's just a thought wheel or a reflection, mm. perhaps, we could, we could consider. Yeah, that's a great reflection. Reminds me of what Pat Petrie uh, was talking to me about. And she was, she was sort of lamenting the loss of time that we spent we spend on wonder we often don't wonder too much now because we can google it if we've got a question we often go straight to well, what what is the answer and actually we need to sit in that space maybe that liminal space lois um where wonder and 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 curiosity and all of those things can sort of and boredom actually you know <laughs> there's a fantastic article on on the wonder of boredom but it, which is something that um perhaps parents now are taught that your child shouldn't be bored but actually that's a great space for creativity to come so perhaps one of the practices that we could do is is rather than or when we have the urge to look it up on google put it down and wonder Put it and get into dialogue and crazy thoughts and thinking. We might get it wrong, but we might find something a little bit more interesting. My mum's struck line in life is intelligent people are never bored. That's what I've heard my whole life. And by God, was I stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the guitar. <laughs> You're right. Who said that? <laughs> my mum. Your mum. Where did she got it from? 
I've obviously never been in a local authority meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Gabriel, should we? Uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah, it's eleven o'clock. So yeah, okay. Doing great. Good, good. Any more thoughts from the breakout rooms? Yes. You, you've got to go, Carol. Carol's got to go. Bye bye. Lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Everybody else, please stay. Please stay. <laughs> Do stay. <laughs> yes. Um, great. So, are people up for a little creative activity? We thought it might be a nice thing to do because it's not just about talking about Ken Robinson, it's also about kind of putting his ideas and the importance of creativity and potentially boredom and stretching ourselves a little bit into practice. So what I will do now is introduce an activity that some of you might know. It's usually in our training rooms. It's called one, two, three. Um, we're going to try a virtual variation of this. Ah. <laughs> I will ask Robin to kind of demonstrate this with me. Okay. And in the first instance, what we'd like you to do in a moment when I put you into breakout rooms um, is to count to three between you. Okay, so it goes like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, simple enough. Are you guys we're watching tennis there between you two. Okay. It is a little bit, very much like tennis. It'll get more complicated in a minute, but I will tell you all about this. So we have 23 participants. So I'll put you into 11. <laughs> okay, so it should work out now. Um, right, what I'd like you to do now, same partners, this time without the 60 second countdown. Um, you have 30 seconds again to count to one, two, three. But what I'd like you to do is replace the one with a clap. So it goes like this. I'll demonstrate it with Robin. Okay, ready? Clap. Two. Three. <laughs> two. Three. Two. Three. Okay, good to give that a go. That's <laughs> good. Okay, did that work out for people? Fantastic. We, were just, we were just getting into our stride and then you dragged us back. <laughs> That's exactly it. You can continue your strike in a moment. Right now, same thing, but this time I'd also like you to replace the number two with a little jump if you can. So you can just jump on your seat. That might be the easiest thing to do because, yeah, um, you're all sitting. Um, so it goes like this. Robin and I will demonstrate it. Three. Okay. Get it? Yeah, got it. So 30 seconds again. Okie doke. So now you're all back. And you can, probably, you can probably imagine what's going to come next which is we're also going to replace number three. And we're going to replace it. Let me just double check. Um, we normally replace it with a, with a twirl, but that's a bit difficult. So what we'll replace it with is a full body wiggle like this. Okay. So Robin and I will demonstrate how this goes completely non-verbally. Perfect. The challenge is this time you're still working with the same partner, but I will not be putting you into breakout rooms. Okay, so you need to find your partner. Oh, on. okay. Oh, cool. You need to find your partner on the screen and make sure that you're perfectly in sync and not completely distracted by everybody else doing the exact same thing at the same time. Gotcha. Ready? Gotcha. Go. <laughs> Gabriel, I can't see anyone else. Okay, I'll do it with you. Okay. Right. <laughs> oh. oh dear. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> Brilliant. 
<laughs> well, that was silly. <laughs> it was very silly. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Good fun, though. It's particularly <laughs> difficult when there's three of you in your group. <laughs> You'll need to use your creativity. <laughs> it's hard with two, isn't it, Cecile? Luckily, nobody's watching. I think, like, I pinned you, um, Nick. So I pinned your window so I could see you, like, as the main thing. So then that made it easier. Oh. oh. That's cheating, Cecile. Yeah. No, this, is, this is it? Very much. No. no. It's it's not not cheating. That's not creativity. That's yeah. great yeah. solution. Uh -huh. Zoom is full of creative solutions. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Brilliant. Anyway, thanks for joining in. I hope it worked for, for most of you. There is a, am I right in saying with this, because um, uh, I did it with Alex briefly in the top right corner of my screen anyway. She's the queen as far as I'm concerned of this activity because she did it in the House of Commons <laughs> when we kicked off the yeah. Head of Hands project. I think, I don't know whether Ed Timpson at the time the minister was doing it, I can't imagine, I like to think that he was there in his suit with his other suited friends doing this, but I don't know whether that was the case. Like you would imagine all the people with the important suits on, they left the room. As soon as I said, I invite you to a fun activity, whoosh! <laughs> <laughs> Am I not right in saying though that there is something about this that lends itself to brain halves and kinesthetic? Uh, something to do with, I kind of almost like a full brain body workout when it comes to learning and it's a really good activity to use in, in learning environments. Am I right in saying that, someone? More that would be a good question. How do people feel doing it this way? maybe for the ones who've done it first time would be interesting as well for the ones who have done it in real before <laughs> yeah i i think it, the the one and two worked well the number three <laughs> became <laughs> a wee bit harder to kind of coordinate but um uh, yeah but we're going to have to be creative in in trying to do um icebreakers and stuff uh, online so it was uh, very good to um, try that so yeah uh, I'm very excited about this I've been longing through the whole of Covid to find ideas like this mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I'm now working with parents and children under five and they have to move I hate the screen time so yeah thank you so much I'd forgotten about this activity Right, yes, I think it it, it, it it translates remarkably well, um, except the mo for the moment when Gordon Gordon froze on the screen. <laughs> Mid jump. <laughs> Mid jump. <laughs> There's a real treasure okay. trove of online icebreakers and energizers like this on the website I just posted. So um, yeah, there's. A, Things yeah. like this are just like exploding quite literally. Um, yeah, the internet is filling up by it. Every day you search, uh, new stuff arrives, really. Carol, good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For, for me personally, it fits really nicely with Ken Robinson's work about, you know, we're, we're taught to count in one, two, three, and we're all quite good at it. And there's something about what happens when you do the same activity, but in a more kind of dancing way, perhaps and how it speaks to different parts of your of your brain brain but also your your body and your soul so there's something about the head heart and hands and yeah trying to find slightly different ways that are more stimulating to do the same thing but i had this strange feeling that when doing it i was like but actually i'm not creative because i'm just doing what gabriel tells me to do um so and then, and then while doing it, actually, because you kind of have to break through the silliness and the kind of feeling of, well, this is really, what am I doing? Th then it kind of puts you in a different space. So I think it's quite interesting, the kind of two together. And yeah. Hmm. I guess, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Gabriel. One, one way I feel it, I know what you mean, it's, it's up on, it, on instructions, isn't it? But what it does is, you're right, it, it stimulates a way of doing different or thinking, acting different around a very simple task. 
with someone else. And, and I think that in a way for me, it's a perfect platform then to explore different learning styles, different personalities around learning and education and stuff like that. So certainly as far as changing the focus and the mindset in a training room as well is a fantastic activity. I thought this worked very well, actually. Almost more fun, in a way. Yeah. And there's something about how we kind of find the creative spaces within an instruction. So, you know, Robin's full body wiggle looked not quite like mine. It looked much more elegant and creative. Sample, like please. Your feet to clap and, <laughs> you know, all, all of these things. So they, for me, there's something about that we we can challenge ourselves to, to think creatively within the framework that we're given. Sometimes that's quite a rigid framework, but that doesn't mean that we can't look for opportunities to yeah, just do things slightly different. And we're all taking a, a risk by, by looking a bit silly, looking a bit daft. And if we can't take a risk like that, then how can we expect others that were inspiring or working alongside to take risks and make mistakes and, you know, change change the culture a wee bit as well so That's let's go such, for it such yeah. an important point there martin sure. and it is it's about relationships as well isn't it and i think uh, for me when i start when i you know stumbled into Thempra's world and and started using social pedagogy and using this particularly in our teaching as well is that just it changes the dynamic of relationships and that's what I find really fascinating and it is like you say Gordon because we are you're prepared I think there's something really powerful in showing people that you're prepared to look a bit silly sometimes and yeah. take a bit of a risk and the relationships that develop from that I think are really important. Uh, Patch Adams is the classic for that isn't it? Yeah just clowning and silliness he even goes in war zones takes clowns into war zones and things it's amazing clowns can be scarier than most soldiers i think <laughs> <laughs> but there is there is some if 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 um ken robinson talks a lot about many things with great skill but one of the things he describes is the tomorrow i feel the, the unknown of tomorrow let alone the unknown of five and ten and twenty years from now and we take a lot of time reproducing an education system or way of upbringing which is very backwardly focused and really in a way as he would put it based on ideas around the industrial revolution what kind of citizens we needed at the time when the education systems were flourishing but now gosh the world is different and in 20 years 30s we don't even know and i guess the idea of stimulating different ways of going about simple activities like this is a good example of ways that we kind of see the the gaps in the current systems wherever they are and try to sort of maybe nurture and propagate a different set of capabilities and, and flexibility creativity and those we know they will be universal qualities to carry forward whereas with other things you would natural learn in school today we can't necessarily say that for definite and so in a way i think this activity links well in that respect as well and I think this links really well to the, thinking about the diamond model and holistic learning. And I know Ken Robinson's work is focused a lot on children and schools and education. But I think this is just as applicable to adults and particularly older adults. And if you think about holistic learning, then creativity and imagination is so key to that. So if you're working with older adults or you're working with adults, getting them, you know, to, you know, lots of people suddenly have a, a crisis and they've got to think of their lives in different ways. So I think that holistic learning on the diamond model, coupled with creativity from Ken Robinson is, is really important. So it's supporting people to think about, actually, you might not be able to do this anymore, but what can you do really well in other ways? What, how are you, you know, let's, and because learning carries on throughout life, doesn't it? It doesn't stop once you leave school. As Alex rightly pointed out, you learn more once you leave school often. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's what, yeah, that the, the defining stuff about what he says. It doesn't define you. It's what, what do you want it to be when you were 12 or 15 and what happened then? And I think in terms of as well, um, for adult learning, you're absolutely right. Um, it, because again, culture is so constructed, it's somehow with childhood, with education, with school, we are done with it, bit university, bit learning your trade. And then it's like little top ups here and there to have the right paperwork in place. Um, but that real joyful learning, um, funnily, yeah, for me came in adulthood, is, is that buying in this, this wanting it, one of these key social pedagogic principles of 
um, choice <laughs> and how powerful that is when you want to learn. And I think that is uh, gets adults in every life stage or can get somebody in every life stage. I think our university degree um, was did that because the age group was phenomenal. It was from the 20s right up to the mid 60s, you know. Obviously, there was only five of us, but there was one in, one in each decade, which we had a, res, a great amount of knowledge and resources to draw on from, you know, all eras, which I think that's what made it for us, really. And also, it was a lot of fun as well. Oh, yeah, it was a, definitely a lot of fun, that wasn't it? definitely a lot of fun. And I think the creative teaching match methods helped with everybody, didn't it? It brought us all out, didn't it, really? you know, being creative with how we learned to match everybody's needs, really. I'll send you the check in the post for saying Thank you. Yeah. All right, well. <laughs> one of my bugbears in social care is how we silo learning. So we, we also have care staff here and everybody goes off in different places. And, and what I found is the best is when you get commissioning officers with social workers, with home care workers, with the people they support, and they all got different experiences of reality and, and it's, it's lovely the learning is right and they love it and yet still we get they get sent off on separate training you know we'll do that for the social workers we'll do that for the care providers it drives me mad yeah, yeah. absolutely robin you're on your <clears throat> sorry Maybe also if people have as well ideas how this kind of stuff could any movements around for education i'm mother of a young child goes to school and I think I would really love if people have ideas or move, know about things which might be interesting to maybe post it um, here or yeah I, I copy on the chat go on, go on somewhere else somewhere there else are people see. putting things on in the chat box there as yeah. well already so that's awesome thanks Carol and Jesse and others who I can't quite see at the moment. We're coming to the last sort of five minutes or so. So we wanted to, uh, Gabe, will you share the screen? Yes, so I am just sharing the screen so that you can see we've extended the, the Jamboard um, again. So it's the same link with which you can, you can log in again if you've closed it on your browser or you can just open it again. Um, so this is what the Jamboard looks like. We'll clear it up a little bit later on um, but make sure that all of these things are captured um, so you've done some amazing um, creative work here really yeah some quotes and sharing some little kind of notes about what he's meant and drawing some lovely pictures um, so here is one question we'd like you to think about right now which is how can we take forward his legacy individually? And if you change the frame at the very top here, um, then you can also find frame four, which is how can we take forward his legacy collectively? So in response to Alex's question about movements or anything else that you feel there is a movement for this or there's a forum for that, um, please, please do post it. So I'll resend the link again and um, stop screen sharing because you need to open it on your own um, on your own computers for it to work and if you haven't got it open then the link is as follows will we return to the group before concluding or is this yeah round for now okay. yeah and i think we can carry on the discussion while people fill in the jam boards but we thought it was important for us to think about what yeah. we can do individually what you know do, I'm kind of what want to kind of think about a, a pledge from his legacy that I am personally going to to enact and do something with because if we don't do action after our reflections we're just navel gazing um, and um, and then collectively uh, and this is this, this webinar came um, about as uh, a part of uh, what happens when uh, there's good relationships with um, 
different organisations and different individuals. So, um, so Spa and Treehouse and, and uh, the lovely Thempra um, came together on this. But how would you want Spa, Thempra, Treehouse, your organisation, all of us together, um, how can we take this forward? Because the man might have died, but his legacy really needs to live on and and that life is in our hands to some degree not okay. that i think absolutely and i think we need to make sure that it's more than just powerful words yeah because um, it's provided the most powerful words possible i think making a really strong case for change um in a way that's reached millions already um but we need to see more of is really how that is reflected in practice in schools but in any other settings because mm. i think the, this notion of education learning creativity relationships and all of that is central to any learning setting any environment that we find ourselves in not just schools so whether you're managing an organization um that does something completely different or whether you work in a children's home or in an early year setting or anywhere else in a social work team the questions are, I think, the same about how can we create a microclimate for relational learning. And creativity. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just checking this out. There's some really lovely stuff already. So we can't share it and watch it being developed live. Is that... Well, we can do that, um, but can't see each other. Then you you can't you can't develop you so you can't contribute to it on the shared screen. You can do that on your own screen. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still learning this Jamboard thing. Hey, we right now, so that we can all look at it together and see ourselves. Um, so you can choose what you want to do, um, and where you might want to group all the little pictures now. Oh, awesome. <laughs> oh, somebody's going to take some time to wonder and not Google immediately. I like that pledge. I'm going to put that pledge up too. Yes. A chat group, yeah. We can inspire others by being creative and brave in all we do. It does take courage, yes. Robin. And yeah. Was it you that once said uh, not so long ago about the foundation? We talked about how we actually ought to contact his foundation or the trust and create some dialogue. I thought that's a really good point as, as a connection, really. Um, yeah. Shall I put that? I'll put that on here, shall I? Yeah. Put that on the on the on the next frame because that's the yeah. Uh, collective one. Yeah. Cool. Let's see what's happening here. Can I do oh. that? Yeah. Talk with people with whom we disagree about the way forward for education. Awesome. Uh, use social pedagogical processes for discussion to lead to consensus. Nice. Yeah. And use creative ideas from people like Lalu. There are so many crossovers, aren't there, with, with other writers. Um, that's, that's an awesome one there. Yeah, his videos, and he does um, some short videos. I've just put the link. And honestly, some of the creative ideas he's got are absolutely brilliant. So things like, um, instead of, you know, all of us, if we're dead honest, I don't read team meetings minutes that come round. Um, so he's talking about, you know, just an audio recording, two minutes, quick video, send it round. And um, I know that one of our MA students has started doing that, and he's seen a massive response from his staff team. Um, really? So, yeah, 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 seriously. Because a lot of us, you know, I skim, read the minutes. I don't, you know, we, we all, we're all busy. We, we don't, we're not interested, are we? So I think it's thinking about creative, different creative ways. I'm going to start creatively dancing the minutes from now on. <laughs> then do oh. you that, please? please share that. <laughs> Maybe you could do a creative dance summary of this webinar. I will do. <laughs> Oh yeah, more dancing. Can't get enough. I hate to say this, folks, but we've actually 
it gone over time. It is now 11.31. I know lots of people are beginning to have to go. Yeah. So um, I suppose it just leaves it for me to say thank you so much to Tour uh, for doing some background and uh, to Gabriel and, and uh, to Adriana, without whom none of this would ever work, as we all know. Um, but yeah. thank you especially to you for coming and to, um, to contributing to this um, and we are going to share the wall and the, the video of this will be going up online. And we really need to look at that, how we take this forward collectively as well. And I wish you well on your creative journeys through this uh, changing the education. We will change the education paradigm. It might take a while and it might just be in little bits and pieces, but together we can. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Hey, lovely, lovely to see such a wonderful bunch of people. Have a wonderful Friday and a really good weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>